we gave our guest a couple of minutes to catch his breath after appearing on stage at one of the sessions here in the National Summit. He was the uh, last U.S. Small Business Administration administrator during the George W. Bush term in office. He was on our show by telephone before, and now he's serving as a senior fellow with the Council on Competitiveness, which is so closely involved with the National Summit here in Detroit. Sandy Barua, nice to meet you in person. How are you? Frank, it's great to put a face with the name. We've talked on the phone. This is great. Uh, good to, to see you. The, the session went well, you were telling me? Frank, I think the session went exceptionally well. We were talking about, you know, America's role in the globalized economy. And, you know, the bottom line is, is that the globalized economy is going to expand both opportunity and challenge every single day. And we have the choice. We can either let it happen without us or we can be engaged and help shape it. In Washington, politicians are saying we have to stop American companies from hiring foreign workers, setting up plants in China, sending jobs down to Mexico. We have to stop this. What happens if we do? Well, two things happen. First of all, we employ more Americans in the United States by foreign companies than Americans who have lost their jobs. Now, certainly when an American loses their job, it's, that is something the government needs to do. We need to be compassionate. We need to provide them programs. But we employ more people in the United States thanks to foreign direct investment. The second thing that that would do is that that would prevent, you know, great companies like Buick to be successful in China, great companies like Ford to be successful in Europe. I mean, we, our U.S. companies set up shop in other countries, one, to access for talent and access to market. Uh, some of it is a cost, but you're looking, you're seeing now that a lot of the companies that have outsourced their jobs primarily due to cost ra uh, reasons are starting to bring those jobs back in the U.S. because they're finding out the cost savings really aren't all that great once they take into all the costs. Mm -hmm. Is there a danger that we're headed toward protectionism? I am very concerned about that, Frank. And, you know, uh, here's a great story about how you have to be careful what you look for. In the 1980s, we implemented the voluntary restraint agreements. Remember those folks, you know? And those said two things. One, Japan, we need more time for our U.S. auto industry to get its feet back on the ground. Don't sell, send us so many Datsuns and Toyotas. And secondly, if Japan, if you want to make cars here, build them here. Well, that's exactly what Japan did. They built their cars here, and that allowed Japan to more rapidly respond to the U.S. market. Look at any Toyota dealership today. Camrys, Highlanders, Tundras, all of those cars, Toyota's best sellers in the United States, are North American specific products. You go to Tokyo, you go to Berlin, you go to Paris, you don't see a Camry, you don't see a Tundra, you don't see a Highlander. Those are North American products produced in North America for North American consumers. And so what, what should our strategy be in regards to these companies that, that have the investment in other countries? We need to be flexible and adaptable as U.S. industry. So we shouldn't be trying to sell to the Chinese or the Japanese a Chevy Suburban or a Lincoln Navigator. We need to find out what do they want and respond to their market and market those products in a way that responds to the local consumer taste. That's what the Japanese have done here very, very successfully. We've done that in our own country for our consumers. We, we have, but, you know, you, you, you get, you know, uh, one of the things when I was working for President Bush, I traveled the world, uh, and, you know, you, you, occasionally you'd find a, uh, a, a, an American car going down the street that didn't have an embassy plate on it, and it was, you know, it was a high-profile car like a Charger or a 300C or a Mustang or something like that, or novelty cars, and, but, you know, we, we don't have the mass market. We haven't, we haven't decided that we want to invest the time and effort to really make some of these markets uh, a go, if you will, for, for U.S. Uh, industry, for US co uh, companies. Mm -hmm. How does it feel to be part of the administration that's getting all the blame now for what's happened to the economy? <laughs> this is your fault, Sandy. Well, and 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 I, you know, Frank, and I'll take my fair share of that of, of that blame. What okay? is your What is your share of the blame? Where Where do you bear responsibility? Well, I for think I, uh, here, here's here's the deal. Uh, the, the The credit crisis that we uh, are still you know working our way through is one. It's bipartisan, both you know sponsored by both the Democratic and Republican Party. It's both public and private. You know, private industry, you know, was was irresponsible and you know didn't focus on long-term brand value. They didn't make prudent decisions. And individuals, we as individuals, we spent too much, we borrowed too much, and we just assumed that you know things things would always roll. And government forced loans to people who 
should never have done them. Ben Bernanke and, and I believe it's Alan Greenspan were before the, the House Banking Committee, the Senate Banking Committees. How many times to implore them to do something about Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which for more than a decade had been piling up these mortgages that could not possibly be repaid. They were warning we were headed headed for just the catastrophe that we're seeing. Yeah. And you, you, you looked at Freddie and Fannie Mae. Uh, that is one of the things that, uh, that we as the Bush administration went to Congress and said, listen, Freddie and Fannie need to be reformed. Uh, we were basically turned away at, uh, at the door. Uh, the Glass-Steagall Act, which was uh, implemented during the Depression years that had a lot of controls for the financial institutions, a lot of that was repealed and modified during the Clinton administration. So there's blame to go around. And what we didn't do right, and I'll be perfectly honest about this as, as, as the Bush administration, is that, you know, if you look closely, looking back on it, there were warning signs. Now, private industry didn't see those warning signs, state governments didn't see the warning signs, but we didn't see the warning signs, but we were in the seat of, of power, we were in the federal government, we should have been able to respond a little bit more rapidly. Sandy, last September 15th, there was a run, an online run on banks in the United States. It was talked about by a, a Democratic congressman uh, named Ken Jorsky out of Pennsylvania, um, whom we've tried and tried and tried. He won't talk any more about it after revealing this. But he said there was an online run by someone on our banks that almost destroyed our entire system, and that's really the the tipping point for what we're seeing today. Well, I think Congressman Ken Jersky may have a minority view on that. Uh, you know, uh, one, I, I think there's some, some debate on that. Certainly there was a period of time where people were pulling their money out of financial institutions and sticking it in their mattresses. Uh, you know, fortunately, we're, we're, we're past that crisis. Was there an organized run on the banks, though, by someone trying to, to ruin our economy? I, I really don't think so, Frank, but I, I don't want to pretend that I know something that I don't know. All right. I, I, I've always wondered about it because it, it's the kind of stuff where, you you know, it's the tinfoil cap stuff, you know, if, if it's wrong. And none right. of us want to be there, but, but by the same token, you hear that kind of thing and you go, could it have happened? Well, Frank, my my experience with with members of Congress or elected officials, and Lord knows I've had my more than my fair share of experience with these, these with these folks, is that when they stop talking about something, it really means that they don't want to. They wish they hadn't talked about it in the first place because it's really hard to get any politician to stop talking about anything. That's very true. Where are we going with this national summit? What do you see coming out of this, and, and where is it headed in the future? I think this national summit is a key element of an ongoing national discussion on innovation and competitiveness in our country. And I think you look at what the U.S. Council on Competitiveness has done, what, uh, what was some of the work that we did in the Bush administration with our national summits, with this amazing summit that's being hosted by the Detroit Economic Club. This is all part of a broader discussion that really has changed the, the conversation in this country. Go back five, ten years ago. Were we talking about issues like competitiveness or innovation? Not really. But now, I mean, you know, the American people are focused on this issue, and this summit, with the incredible media attention that it's getting, CNBC is broadcasting live from this building, as, as, as are you. Uh, we're getting a lot of great national attention to this, and it's getting leaders and, more importantly, the average American citizen, you know, uh, on board to a plan to say, listen, we need to do something, we need to do something together, and it's going to require some tough choices uh, of our politicians, and we as voters need to empower our leaders to make those tough choices. Sandy, thank you for coming by. Really appreciate it. It was nice to meet you in person. I hope you're enjoying your stay in Detroit. I love Detroit, and I'm a big fan of, of the auto industry, so Frank, it's great to meet you. Same here. We'll be back with more of the Beckman Show on June.